Okay, we're begun and then people are gonna file in virtually, of course. And I told you, uh, Nicole, that this is also part of a class. Mm. So uh, I think I told you this, but a lot of, a lot of this surprise, a lot of the students <laughs> that are, a lot of the people here are just gonna be part of this packaging design class. So they might have questions related to what they're working on or whatever. Um, but this is also open to the public. So they're just people that wanted to attend. Cool. All right, so everyone's hopping in. Welcome everybody. It's gonna give it a, maybe like 15 seconds or so just to make sure everyone, <clears throat> excuse me, is in. Okay. All right, I'll get started. Uh, so welcome everybody to the spring 2024 Sarah Little Turnbull Visiting Designer Speaker Series. Um, this is the second talk in the series. Uh, just a reminder that this semester we're going to be talking about package design and packaging uh, within the context of UX design, um, among other things. In this series, we're exploring how all of these elements intersect to shape, intersect to shape user experiences and perceptions. Um, I was talking about, uh, I mentioned this just at the start, but this is also part of a class. Uh, so, you know, a class is actually watching this um, and taking notes, hopefully, but also asking questions. We have a Q&A module at the bottom of the, the Zoom screen where you can, it's different than the chat. The chat's a little harder for me to monitor, but I will monitor the Q&A. Uh, and if you have any questions that I think fit into the discussion with our guest, I'll throw them out and we'll talk about them. Um, today, uh, I'm honored to introduce Nicole McLaughlin. She's a multidisciplinary designer renowned for her in innovative approach to sustainability and creativity. And while Nicole's work spans a bunch of different disciplines, her expertise and transforming discarded materials into functional objects, I think offers pretty valuable insight into the role of packaging, and in this case, repackaging uh, in enhancing user experiences. Through her accessible and functional practice, Nicole exemplifies the importance of integrating sustainability into UX design processes. And we're gonna discuss these issues and challenges surrounding the philosophy of sustainability uh, and its implications for package design and UX. And we're also just gonna have generally have some fun. So welcome, please, uh, Nicole McLaughlin to the Turnbull Visiting Designer Speaker Series. Nicole, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Yeah, super excited to be here. This is a yeah. class that I feel very passionate about. So I'm really happy to be speaking with you all today. Yep. So do you want to bring up your slides and then yeah. take a look at some of your awesome work? Sounds good. Let me get this going here. By the way, while you're doing this, I found Nicole on Instagram. This is how I was, I happened to see your viral. So I was like, what is this? This is incredible. And then I followed you and that's how I, you know, never saw your stuff in a gallery. It was all yeah. like, through, you know, I love that scrolling. though. It's so yeah. funny because I mean, that's how all this really started for me. I'll get into it, but it's mostly like it, it started social media and that's how a lot of people discovered my work. And also I decided sure to make this a business like at the start of COVID, which was a yeah. great time to, you know, go freelance and try your own thing. But it gave me the opportunity to have the internet on my side, which was pretty cool, but. Yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, I'll start off just saying, uh, hi, my name is Nicole McLaughlin. I am a designer focused on upcycling and I live in Boulder, Colorado. I'm currently in New Jersey in my parents' house, so this isn't my <laughs> normal background. Um, so apologies, I might be a little out of my element, but my normal element is rock climbing and being outside. So I love to spend time outdoors and Upcycling became, went from being a hobby to a job, and I'll kind of explain how I got there. But first, I'll give you a little background of how I started. So I went to school for sign language, actually, for speech language pathology. Um, mm -hmm. I had a group of deaf friends when I was in high school, and it made me really curious about speech language and trying to do sign language as a career. I was in college and realized I wasn't so keen on all the science and math portions of uh, speech language pathology and loved sign language as an art. And so I was doing videos of me 
doing sign language and I think mm -hmm. photography and video became really important to me and so I actually switched my major and I graduated with a degree in digital media technology and with that degree I was able to snag an internship at Reebok and that was my first job out of college I graduated in 2015 and I did a year-long apprenticeship uh, working at Reebok as a graphic designer for apparel and footwear. So this wasn't really my background. The fashion industry was never something I like pictured myself working in, but I'm super grateful that I was able to have this opportunity. I never thought of like creating graphics that were going to be taken off of a screen and put onto a garment. Um, and that definitely forced me to think a lot differently about the things that I was creating. So um, I always like to work with my hands. And so with the graphic design position, I was very much on the computer all day, but I always tried to find ways of taking paint and, you know, spray painting things and taking photos and making collages and then turning those into prints and things that were going to be put on clothing and footwear. So this really got me thinking a lot about the process of design. I don't think I really fully realized how important it is to consider every step of the process when you're starting. Um, creating a graphic, you know, you want it to be placed in a way that feels uh, authentic and it's not just like slapped on at the end. So being able to work cross-functionally with apparel design or with footwear design to be able to come, with, come up with ideas together. But also I had the opportunity to go to factories a lot. And I think that was really important for me because when you're sitting in office looking through swatches and books of different types of treatments for graphics, you, it's so easy to be like, I want to pick the glow in the dark treatment for this, not realizing like how unsustainable some of those things are. So I think having the opportunity to go to the factory, see it firsthand really showed to me like, okay you know, being smart with the decisions you're making while you're creating from the start of the design process. Um, and from there, this is sort of what the office looked like on a day-to-day. -day. And these aren't pictures from Reebok, but this is what the hallways look like in most footwear and apparel design offices. So there's a lot of boxes of a lot of shoes, half pairs of shoes, swatches, samples, things that are not really that useful because it might be a half a pair of shoes or you know sub fabric and sub material so it can't really be worn it can't really be donated and it always just had these big signs that said shred on them so I took it upon myself to go basically dumpster diving and taking some of these things home with me without much of a plan but I knew that there was still life there was still value left in these things um and so it got me thinking a little bit about this, and this is the only real chart. I am very photo oriented in this presentation, but this is my one little chart that I'll show. Um, I really only understood the linear economy. That's really like what I knew, what probably most of us know is like, you get something, you know, you use it for a while, it gets thrown in the trash. Maybe, you know, recycling, you know, plastic water bottles, things like that. But the circular economy was something that was really foreign to me. I had never really thought of the idea of repairing something, reusing something over and over again. Um, but because I saw that trash laying there, I was like, I feel really inspired to want to do something with it. And so I did. Um, I started taking packaging. I started taking things that were in my house, things that were in the office, taking it home and decided to teach myself how to sew and how, well, started with hot glue, started with stapling clothes together. And then I eventually learned how to hand sew and then machine sewing cut my time in half. So um, these were some really early projects that I did. It was super rough at the time, um, but it's really cool to look back on and be like, look at all the potential with these this trash. And little did I know I was about to start a business on it. So um, I also did a lot with footwear. I think just working in the footwear space, I got really inspired by like branding and colors, um, materials. So these were, that was a sole that I found in one of those boxes. And I was like, oh, this blue looks like this Ikea bag. And it just kind of spiraled from there. Um, and I got better at it. I started to make shoes all the time. And I was taking things like volleyballs and untraditional materials or old jackets and turning them into footwear and I had such a 
like a perfect scenario of like it's such a simple shape to do like a slide or a clog it's like the same thing but it could be done so many different ways so that was me challenging myself and trying to use all these different types of materials focusing on like a subject like cameras or you know a workwear material and really expanding on that um and then from there I decided to quit my job. So I worked at Reebok for about four years. And then in 2019, um, I decided to, I was like, you know what, if this brand has all this stuff, what about all the other brands in the industry? Like I could only imagine how much there is. Like we think about waste maybe at like post-consumer waste, but you don't always think about the waste that it takes to even make the stuff. So I'll give you like a quick example. I'll go to the next slide. But for footwear, at least, it could take like four or five rounds of samples for one shoe a season, and that's a half a pair of shoes. So just multiply that by the amount of shoes that come out in a season and the amount of brands there are in the footwear industry. So it's a lot of samples that get thrown away. Um, and then this was an example of some soccer goalie gloves. Um, these were all like half pairs or, you know, weren't completely so, like sewn all the way things that were just laying around the Puma office and um, brands started to realize that there was a lot of potential with some of this waste and I was really happy to be able to show them how cool things could turn out. So it went from taking things like this and turning them into things like this um, to just prove my point of like why these things are useful, why it's so important that we keep these things like you already spent all the material, like the money and the time to make these materials. Like why, why are we so easily just throwing them away? Even if it's, you know, a sample, go ahead. Yeah. I have, a, I have a quick question though. I mean, this is amazing, but like how much in background do you have in fashion design? Like, like how did you construct <laughs> the jacket? Like, how do you know the shape of a body? Like, did you have any background in that? Or did you um, just kind of wing it? Like how did no, you No, I I was winging it and I'll I have a slide where I'm going to show you coming in two slides where I okay. my approach to design and why like how I got to this because I didn't have the skills like I said I was like hot gluing things I was wow. just you know stapling things together and I started to here's another like example of taking things and patchworking them and these were wow. scraps from uh leather bags that I was able to make a little chair and umbrella set for the store but here's so here's the process <laughs> so literally putting material on my body I think that was the biggest thing was like I always used my body as a mannequin and my foot as a last and I just will I still do it I still drape things I mean now I know pattern making a bit better after doing this for a while but my little understanding of patterns from working at Reebok but then also just physically putting things on myself and seeing what shapes it makes. And the thing about upcycling that I love is that uh, these materials already have shape. I'm not forcing it to do something it doesn't want to do. Like it already drapes a certain way. And if it drapes a way that I like, you know, um, I always think about like the heel of a shoe looks really nice as like a shoulder piece, like it contours or an elbow piece. Like you think about how these shapes kind of can play with your body and like imagine yourself wearing them and where they would fit the best. So it's a lot of trial and error, but I love having the chance to interact with the material in such an intimate way. <laughs> yeah, I feel like you have to be a little playful in order to do this. Like there's artistry in it. It's like, I, I don't know, like if you, do you consider yourself more of an artist or a designer? Or did you not even identify on that spectrum? Is How do you feel? about that lines are blurry and I like yeah. that, ask that question because I think a lot of people aren't really sure what to say about my work because they're like it's fashion but it's also kind of art and I like that it's a bit blurry yeah. because it doesn't okay. lead me to staying in one lane I could kind of try different things um, fair enough yeah but it's yeah it's like some things are super functional that I make and I'll get a little into that, but some things are like really just meant as an idea and just me just trying to get an idea out of my head and making stuff was more of like, this was all just trial and error. Like I said, I was like, I don't know what's going to come out of this. This could look horrible. But at the same time, I was like, well, why not try? If it's already trash. Why not try to use it? So, um, and then something interesting, I think, about my work that not a lot of people know is that it's constantly in rotation. So I don't have like a huge archive of all the pieces I've made. 
I actually consider the photo to be the final piece. And that allows me to continue to upcycle the same materials over and over again. And I think during COVID, actually, that was like the biggest challenge for me was like, I didn't have, I left Reebok. So I didn't have that waste stream of all those boxes anymore. Um, I didn't have thrift stores. I didn't have like that opportunity to go out. So I started just taking things that I already made apart. And so here's some examples of like, you know, the sweater becomes shorts or the shorts become shoes or the, sh the shorts become a bag. Like it's kind of this uh, constant evolving practice. And that's what I really love about it. I think that's what makes me so hopeful because I'm like, I could see how far these things could be pushed. And here's like another example. It's like Carhartt, such a iconic material. And it's like, maybe you've never seen it in a bra, <laughs> in a bra and panty set before, but now you have, and uh, it then turns into shoes. So it's kind of this ever evolving thing. So I think like, this is what's really, I love this. And I think what I dig about is like, I wear Carhartt, right? I mean, I'm from upstate New York. I grew up wearing this kind of clothes and it's clearly associated with a certain type of identity, like ruggedness, masculinity, um, blue collar, working people. And then you've taken it and you've turned, you've just like totally turned that brand on its, on its side, on its end. And it's now it's not necessarily gendered, but it's, um, you flip the script in a lot yeah. of interesting ways. And it, it, is that like, were you thinking about doing that or that just sort of emerge as you worked with the materials, as you say, kind of happens when you're doing this? So like in this case, I feel like it just sort of happened. Like, I think my relationship with like femininity is like just inherent in what I do just because as a woman like I think yeah. about you know these are a garment that I would maybe wear or something <laughs> like that but I mean maybe not this per se but right. like in general right. like garments that like a woman would wear but I don't think I realized like the true context of that and it's funny that you brought that up where it's like I this picture ended up circulating so far onto like uh -huh. reddit mostly reddit and it was like there was a subreddit of like women who work within the construction field yep. and it's like all women who that that do like these more blue collar jobs and this picture was like so favored by them they're like hell yeah like representation yeah. like and it's so cool because I didn't I wouldn't have thought that it would reach you wouldn't have thought about that, that. yeah exactly but I think it's really cool I think that's interesting it's like the non the non-intentional like life of your work is really interesting to me like there's this other element here which is that women have trouble finding clothes with pockets right and and <laughs> it, right it's like a class right and this is a classic thing it's root and rooted in our society and what it means to be a woman um something I don't need to worry about as a man right I have pockets all over the place um but that po limiting the amount of pockets limits what one can do with tools or what one carries with them and here you are you're not just like taking a brand and recontextualizing it you're like actually providing women with I mean they're impractical in a sense but yeah. that's kind of the point like it's all part of the same language I think that that design language is incredibly valuable and important on a very sort of uh, in terms of like gender equality if we got to bring it to that you know so yeah, just obsessed. yeah I think that's yeah. such a great point and it's funny because like maybe I'm overcompensating by putting pockets <laughs> on everything like I love storage <laughs> I love like making things like so this is a good example of like utility like I love yep. things that are like way like so far past utility that it's like yeah. is even is it it's even absurd anymore it's absurd um, yeah but yeah. I think for me like as a designer I think I would look at inspiration images um to like get started on a project and sometimes you need to see like the craziest thing in order to make something practical like you might look at this and it's maybe they're too wild or too out there to be wearing but you could get inspired by like the color or like you know the transparency of the water storage thing like you never really know what could be the source of inspiration so I always am like listen it might not be the most practical thing but there's something there there's something like starting in my head but um and that like the not practical stuff has led me to doing things like high heels where it's like putting taking the same I have literally used the same high heel if you go like look through my Instagram that this poor heel has been used like 
hundreds of times and I've just replaced the thing that goes on the heel. And it just always makes me laugh to see um, how many things fit in that. But on the topic of laughing, um, I think I use humor as an opportunity to discuss a topic like sustainability. Um, that's intentional. That's not like out of nowhere. I do think bringing humor, A, it's just like something I like. I like to be funny and I like to laugh and I like to make people laugh. And I think it's cool to have that um, opportunity through my work to be able to bring people together. Um, and I always hope that they they come for like the funny, the memes, the jokes, but they stay because the larger message of sustainability of, about upcycling, like I think it's a really cool way to broach a difficult topic. And a lot of the conversations I'm in, I do a lot of like panels around sustainability and go to a lot of conferences. And to be honest, it's really dark sometimes and it's really depressing and it's like, it's important and it's important to feel that sense of urgency and to feel a little bit scared. But at the same time, it's like, we need some light at the end of the tunnel. We need to laugh. So that's really intentional. And I'm glad that I get to have a lot of fun every day. Um, I also really love to use uh, different, really obscure materials. So I use shower curtains a lot. <laughs> so these are made out of shower curtains, the transparent material. So things that would um, like most likely get thrown away. I, I tried it the first time I took like a shower curtain that was in my apartment, took it off, cleaned it, and then was like, I could use this as a base material. And that really spiraled into me making everything transparent and seeing what I could stick inside of it. Um, here's another bra. <laughs> um, food is also a, a material that I use, but I think it's probably the most challenging material because I never want to make something that's not edible or I, I don't want to waste it. And so I don't use any glue. I can't sew any of this like in a machine. It doesn't work. I've tried to sew bread in a machine, not happening. Um, and so I've found ways to use like structures on the inside, whether that's through like Baker's, uh, string or toothpicks or things to create structure. And then afterwards I can take it out and then I have a lunch and then, you know, win-win for everybody. So, um, food is a great uh, challenge. If you start to run out of materials, um, try to use food. Um, and then I just want to briefly go into, this project that I worked on, uh, I did a project with Hermes. And if you're familiar with uh, the fashion industry or more of the luxury sector of the fashion industry, Hermes is a brand that's pretty untouchable. They're kind of like the peak and pinnacle of the fashion industry. Um, and they surprisingly came to me with all these amazing bags that were probably hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of bags. They were damaged, but in my opinion, I was like, they're still perfect. Like they're still great. Like how, I don't know how I'm going to cut these things up or like destroy these bags that are like perfectly fine. And so it was just cool for the fact that Hermes like wanted to do an upcycling project. It was for a magazine that they did. And I found creative ways to use the bags without having to cut them. Um, so it just goes to show that upcycling doesn't always mean that you have to completely destroy something in order to see a result. Um, and that project led to a project with Gucci too. So I think the high fashion part of the industry is really interesting to me. It's never a space that I thought I'd be in. It's never a space that I bought. I never could afford luxury. I never even still like, you know, it's not something that I would choose to wear, but I think it's really interesting to me because they set the tone for the rest of the industry. So whatever decisions that they're making can trickle down to mainstream fashion or even fast fashion. So having them be conscious about the materials that they're using, but also the, the opportunity to take responsibility for the stuff that they're producing. They're, they're producing a lot less compared to fast fashion. And so I think if they could communicate and kind of find ways to, you know, get things together a little bit better. I think it would be a really cool opportunity. So having the chance to work with these two brands has been really cool. Um, and then I just want to quickly talk about a shoe that I have coming up this year. So a sneak peek um, of a project that I feel really passionate about. So all the projects that I've shown so far, those are all one of one pieces. And 
they only exist and then I take them apart and it continues, but I don't really have the bandwidth or the opportunity to make things at scale. And part of that's intentional and part of it's circumstances where it's like the material I get is that's all I have. And I, you know, I don't have the luxury of having multiples and multiples of things to make so many of them. So it's usually just one of a kind. Um, and so I'm working with Puma right now to do a project and it's still small in the grand scheme of the footwear industry, but it's like 500 pairs and it's a fully upcycled shoe. And these are all uh, factory scraps. So offcuts from various different shoes, shoes that were taken back and disassembled. And then the sole is a reground sole from previous shoes. So this is a really big step. Um, I've done other footwear collaborations that have had recycled components, compostable components, but like this feels the closest to upcycling at scale and helping brands kind of figure out like the way that I do my practice into in, incorporating that into the way that they work. Um, and while talking about that, I figure we should talk a little bit about packaging and uh, how interesting, but also difficult and challenging it is, especially within at least my part of the industry with footwear. Um, it's really challenging because, so I went to a summit uh, June of last year for Copenhagen Fashion Week. And Maersk was one of the partners, and they're one of the biggest global shipping companies, if not the biggest. Um, and one of their talks, they were talking about how 30% of shipping containers are dead air. And that was a really big flag to me because I was like, okay, why is there so much space? And part of that is because brands share, like, comp or factories share shipping containers. So different brands are having boxes in a shipping container that gets sent to the US or, you know, Europe, wherever. And they, a lot of the time they don't communicate in order to get these containers full. So half the time they're just sending things out as they're sort of ready, but then also the way that the boxes fit into itself is like, that was the biggest thing that I was like, wow, red flag. Like this is the design problem not as much of a shipping problem where you think about shoe boxes and I put this example here and how they don't fit together perfectly. So that's wasted space. And that's like a crazy like red flag for design. Like that's something that, you know, we could try to design around or solve. And then here's some other examples of things. It's like, then they've tried to create like lower waste packaging where it's like, there's less like tissue paper and stuff inside of it. But then again, you have that issue of like, Yes, the box is smaller, but that's a really strange shape. And how does that fit into each other? Um, and then a couple other examples for like apparel, um, water soluble packaging, I think is a really cool invention. And I think it works if you're shipping things more locally, but there was issues with shipping um, those types of packages overseas, or if they're sitting on a shipping container, if it gets moisture, they start to melt and disintegrate while they're getting shipped. So. These are all things, I mean, I'm not coming here to say I have the answers to these things, but I think it's a really cool design prompt and something that like I personally feel really passionate about after being in that conference and realizing like all this data behind why um, makes you want to solve some of these issues. So this is something I hope that you and I could talk a little about, bit about. And um, yeah, that was a, a quick little thing. And then the, my yeah. last slide here is just workshops. I teach workshops. Please, if you're ever interested in coming to a workshop of mine, I would love to teach people how to sew and how to get started on upcycling. I think it's a great skill to have. Um, and that's pretty much it. <laughs> sorry, I, I was glitching. I'm sorry. I think I might be, be glitching on my end, so forgive me. All good. If in the, no, if in the middle of me talking, I just freeze. Uh, just I'll, I'll repeat it. So this is amazing. I do have questions about actually the workshops. Uh -huh. What kind of stuff happens in them? I think they're like pretty fascinating. And I, I just was kind of interested in like what you do and how you approach those. Um, yeah, so the workshops are, are mostly help put on with brands. And so we'll do like retail or like consumer facing workshops where a brand will basically take the samples or take any returned product. So a lot mm. of the retail stores will have like boxes of returned things that got like snagged or like 
you know, they couldn't be sold again. So they'll collect them and then we'll do a workshop of teaching people how to repair these things or to turn these things into something else. I also do workshops at companies themselves. So like internal design uh, teams, which I think is really cool. Oh, wow. It's really fun. Like I think after working at a company, I would have loved that opportunity to like take a day to yeah. take all your old product that's sitting around and try to find a way to use it. Because I think they have the coolest perspective because they're the ones that are making this stuff. Like they know that product the best. So it's yeah. always like the stuff that they make is always so cool. Yeah, totally. But yeah. I think that you might be frozen. <laughs> uh, it's it's interesting. Um, that makes me think of, you know, it's like you're in the factory, they're working with this product that's, that's all they see. So they don't get to see perhaps another angle on the materials they work with. So it's like you have found a way to do that. I think that's like a really interesting point. Um, I, I just wanted to ask, uh, I have a couple of questions. I do have a question here um, from some Q&A and I just wanted to throw those out to you because I'm a little interested in the answers, but is there an industrial source that you, has particular appeal to you as an opportunity for upcycling? I mean, you showed us shoes, mm -hmm. uh, other types of fashion, but is there like a, an industrial source or some kind of industrial product that you're kind of interested in working with that maybe you haven't? Yeah, I mean, I'm actually, this is something I'm currently exploring because I, I'm i very much in the world of clothes and shoes, but I started to transition to more like, not like less malleable materials. So more like metals and woods yeah. and trying to see like, cause there's a lot of scrap, especially in Colorado where I'm living, like a lot of metal scrap, a lot of um, tech waste is something that mm. I'm super interested in. Yeah, I, There's a lot of potential there. I made, I did this, I hosted a panel once for Samsung and that was really eye-opening for me. I learned a lot from that, but they ended up sending me this box of old tech waste and it was all phones and I was using it for like really weird things. I paneled, like I used it as like tile, um, like backsplash tile in like a kitchen. I, I made like a grouted tile using all these old phones because it looked really similar. And I was like, this is a really weird way to use this, but like there's so much tech ways. And I think that's a challenge for me. Um, I also think like this isn't something I'm super familiar with, but like knowing people who work within it, the medical fields, like yeah. there's a lot of medical waste, but not in the way like not just like needles and things obviously that you can't touch, but like tubes for like dialysis. There's a lot yeah. of like, leftover things that have never been they're sealed, they're shut, but they can't be used again. And I'm always like, that could be so useful for like artists, like people, like there's definitely a connection there. Yeah, I love, I love medical products. My, my this is neither here nor there. My sister had asthma when, when I was growing up and she, I remember having to go to the hospital a few times and I was, I was like a young kid and I was obsessed with all the different things they had, the masks, the tubes, the, 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 the blankets, the test tubes, like all this amazing stuff that I wanted for some reason, I lusted after it as a child, um, but they don't like really let you play with it. But I just thought it was really cool looking. It's very futuristic looking and it's ripe for some sort of like design revolution. Um, yeah. I, I have a question. How, so how do you think upcycling can contribute to sustainable design in the context of fashion design in the global supply chain? So for example, uh, the fashion design world the world of fashion design it has a goal in mind, right? And it's to push brands and to sell products. But in your, you're now making work for large companies like Puma, Gucci, Hermes, right? How do you see yourself um, contributing to this idea of sustainable design? You said it kind of, it's interesting because you're working with trendsetters in, in the global fashion industry. The decisions that Gucci makes, for example, will resonate down through lots of different um, product designers and, and fashion houses, et cetera. But um, in terms of sustainability, do you see uh, that as something you can maybe like spread through your work, this idea of sustainable design? Yeah, I mean, I think so. And that's where I think like 
My approach is a little bit different because um, the the industry itself focuses a lot on like future materials. And I think that's mm. really important. I'm not saying like, like I think like, like mushroom leathers and all these like really cool right. technologies that we have coming out is like very interesting. And I don't think we should stop obviously creating those things, but I look at it more of like, what about all the stuff that we have already? Like there's so much potential to find ways to use it. The problem lies within the fact that like, A, it's, it's hard to get that material back to the source without it becoming like more unsustainable it's like then you're shipping things back and forth so localizing that is something that you know would be a dream to find like ways to do upcycling small upcycling factories or disassembly factories like within the U.S. so pretty much like preaching back to these companies like why it's important to use the stuff that you have and like why it's it would be more valuable if you were to like it's an investment it really is yeah it's a lot cheaper for them to make new it's it's mm -hmm. more expensive to take rolls of fabric that were like half used or whatever and store them in a warehouse than it is to mill new fabric, which is like that's wrong. Like that's that's yeah, this shouldn't be that way. Exactly. It's, so. it's the it should be the obverse. I mean, that's another question I have, which is, you know, what are some of? I mean, there's obvious envir environmental benefits to upcycling because you're you're generating less waste. Um, but but like compared to like the traditional manufacturing process, could something like upcycling be upscaled to the level of like typical manufacturing? I mean, you're one person working in a in a, in a studio with your own um, sewing machine, and but you can you know can that be like can that pattern be grown into like an international movement so that the products we buy by and large. Mm -hmm. uh, have some sort of upcycling involved do you see that as a possibility is that something that you have space for yeah I mean I always say that because I'm like I it's so easy for me to like be like everybody should be upcycling when it's like it's just me yeah. and I I can just just choose what I want to upcycle that day where it's like a right. company like a Reebok for example has been around since 1895 yeah <laughs> That's yeah. like, and they, I mean, their production wasn't as large as it is today, but it's still like, that's a company that's been doing stuff for so long. Like they have their own ways of doing things. It's really hard to be like, change all the ways that your factory yep. works and your, yep. you know, your supply chain. Like it's not easy to do that. But I do think like that Puma project, it goes to show that like there, there's smaller ways that you could do it, small batch projects where it's like, it is useful because we are using up these small little leftover scraps that are in their factory. Like, is it cost effective? Not yet. Yeah. You know, like transparency well, yeah. Now. And that's another thing I was going to ask you, like, what kind of challenges do you face as an upcycler, as a designer, when you're, when you're doing this, um, particularly in terms of scalability? And like, com I mean, you're obviously commercially viable, right? But not ever. I mean, I'm assuming you're rarely talented at what you do. I don't think most people could do what you do. But um, just in terms of like scale, like, could you foresee taking what you do on a boutique sort of level and scaling it up so that, say, you like hire 20 people or 30 people to to do, and then you're sort of directing the show, right? Is something I feel like that could be possible if there's money behind it. Have you ever thought about, you know, scaling this up to a larger business where essentially all you're doing is upcycling for the most part? Yeah, I mean, I've definitely considered it. I think I always like run into this thing where it's like if I start multiplying some of those pieces that I show, like I've shown in the past, like, right, it, like would it lose its special it's, like it's mystique yeah yeah exactly but I do like I I consult with brands so like for example I'm a ambassador with Arteryx um an outdoor company that's making really technical jackets and they own a factory in Canada where they make like still they still are producing stuff out of there it, it's not like super large quantities but it's the stuff that they have like the most proprietary like they want to keep yeah. it right. But they do their climbing harnesses there. They still do an alpha SV jacket they make out of that factory. And they're super open to doing um, like small batch products at scale. So like small upcycled batch products. And so I can come into a brand like that 
and they could tell me how much yardage they have of certain things or how many leftover harness climbing harnesses that can't be used again because that's a yeah. safety issue and i yeah. could take them and be like okay for every 10 harnesses you could make x amount of shoes or yeah. hats or this or that and so i almost rather be more of a resource for the industry versus yeah. having my own like scaled brand sorry i had glitched again but i <laughs> just okay. catching up so i have another question and it's it's really comes from the consumer side i feel like um the environment the environmental movement really like the government sort of puts a lot of responsibility on consumers to take care of these sustainable and environmental issues so i hesitate to ask questions about what can we as consumers do but um what what how can consumers support upcycling initiatives and make it make more sustainable choices in their fashion design or their fashion consumption habits do you have any advice on that yeah i mean probably nothing that you, you all haven't heard before but i do think yeah. putting your putting your dollars to what matters to you makes a big difference like not supporting a fast fashion company like a shein yeah. like a timu or some yeah. of these drop shippers that are like pumping out hundreds of thousands of things a day I think like that's step number one if you could try I know it's a lot easier said than done because in, like if you want to shop more artisan like fully recycled content pieces it's going to be a lot more expensive but I think if mm. you do really care about this issue like really investing in the things that investing in a piece that will last you longer versus like quick fix trends I think that's yeah. step one that's an easy one um, I mean, I think repairing, like I, that's what I, I know that it's, this is me just preaching because I love what I do, but I think it's really a valuable skill to be able to mend your clothing and to be like, look, take a look in your closet and something that I always say, like something that you've kept in your closet that maybe doesn't like fit you right. Or like yeah. you, you have some type of sentimental value to it, but you don't wear it anymore. Figure out what you could do to make that wearable or valuable again before like yeah. just getting rid of it like there's always opportunity still that's left and you don't have to I always say you don't have to take it to like extreme of like making Carhartt bras or like bread gloves like you don't have to go like that <laughs> crazy with it but like being able to hem your pants is like a huge yeah. thing being able to go to a thrift store and buying something being like oh this doesn't fit quite right instead of just giving it away or throwing it away or whatever find a way to make it work for you so take my workshop, <laughs> take, yeah. take a sewing class, like take, watch YouTube. I learned on YouTube. I learned a lot yeah. of sewing techniques just with watching YouTube. So. Yeah. I love sewing. Sewing is also like a, um, a visceral thing. Like you, mm -hmm. you zone, you kind of zone out when you're doing it and it's very, yeah. it's very like, um, meditative, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I, I wanted to also, in, in terms of like, packaging right and talking about packages i i kind of feel like um we look at packages or i look at packages like walking through a grocery store right you're seeing all you're seeing is a world of packages like a library of packaging right and that includes branding color choices typography uh material choices shape and form um, and it kind of reminded me, as I was thinking about preparing for this talk, it kind of reminded me of John Baudrillard's Simulacra and Simulation. This is a book uh, written by a semiotician, of someone in the semiotics or, or the study of signs and symbols in our society. Um, he was a philosopher, right? Like a contemporary, a, a cultural critic, right? But he talked, basically the gist of it is he, was positing that the real world had essentially been replaced with a world of signs and symbols. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the, that's what creates our shared experience, right? Just signs. We don't really have a, we don't really interact with the real world as much as we do with signs and symbols in our, in our culture. It kind of made me think about it when you were talking about sign language. Uh, it's sort of like, it kind of like resonated with me that you studied sign language. Um, and here we are talking about signs. But uh, and then, you know, I was thinking, thinking about fashion design and fashion as a signifier 
in in my view, when I think about fashion, it signifies certain things like status, your wealth, uh, who you are, like your identity. Mm -hmm. um, I think what's so cool about your work, I guess what really like struck me when I first saw it was that it breaks that vocabulary, that the that like the design language or the language of fashion you took it and recontextualized it and started speaking it in a different way. They kind of poked fun at that. It poked fun of the idea that our identity is somehow tied to what we wear. Um, it recontextualizes it, uh, makes it new into something else. It's not just for me. In other words, it's not just about sustainability and you know, uh, upcycling. It's really like playing with culture uh, and remixing culture. Um, and I, I did ask you this before in one, particular piece but how much of this is intentional on your part to break culture and remix it and rethink it and say new things with it yeah I think you talking about like the branding and like logo mania is something that is yeah. very that is something that is intentional and I think partially coming from like graphic design background I'm just like really heightened to logo placement and like yeah uh, our like relationship with brands and branding um and yeah that's definitely I don't know I feel like it became I didn't maybe at first didn't realize like why I was doing it but over time I'm like I like taking brands that are like more popular like everyone has some type of relationship but then I think a Carhartt is like a great example yeah. because yeah. everybody has seen the Carhartt hat like yeah. the beanie that's like the one like at like but people that are working, you know, um, doing construction work have wear Carhartt uniforms. But then there's also like, I lived in Brooklyn and like Carhartt is like a daily staple for people's just regular outfits. And it's yeah, I'm, cool I'm that looking it's around, like, I have my Carhartt hat like right here. I, was, and I took it off because it's like yeah. too on the nose for today. But, but it's yeah. like class, it's like a classless thing where it's like yep. things that are more like democratic across the board. And like, I guess- I'm trying to think of other brands I've used. I use a lot of like gummy bears, like Haribo. Like that's something like worldwide. Like I want you to be yeah. able to see my work in like other countries and other things. I try not to be so like US centric when I'm like creating things. Obviously it's hard because, you know, that's where I'm buying um, yeah. thrifted items and stuff is like <laughs> I'm finding it at local thrift stores. It's going to say like whatever that's, it's very regional based or whatever. So it's, I just always try to find those like, brands that feel kind of like we all have some type of connection or like products so like legos i've used a lot yeah. where it's like I, I play into nostalgia that's really intentional i think about my own childhood and the things that i liked as a kid like you know bringing those things back into play and making you think a little bit like oh i miss you know playing with legos or like certain toys those types of things yeah and and i you know so there is some I think it's interesting because this I I think it's important to not be doing things intentional at some especially at early stages. Um, but I do think it's also then important to recognize the deeper threads running on, so to speak, running on, underneath your work. But because I feel like intentions and philosophy can all get in the way of the creative process. It definitely yeah. does for me. If I'm like overthinking it, I get paralyzed with thought. So but I do also think that artists and designers have a responsibility to address these things. Uh, what, what do you think about that? Like, how do you, uh, if we're talking about responsibility of the designer in the context of package design, what would you say some of them are? Like, what responsibilities do we have as designers when we're talking about packaging, um, both, both in like containers of things but also just in the identity and branding of things. Yeah, I mean, I think you said, I think you said it kind of right, where it's like you having a philosophy or having like, I think personally like a North Star, like something that you're working towards is a good thing to have because yeah. it gives you purpose, it gives you direction. But I also think like when you get too overly intellectual about it, it could slow you down. And so- yeah think like having goals in mind like whether that that is like creating a sustainable packaging solution or like you know branding that like is clear and um distinguishable some something like that as like a north star is like a good thing mm. but allow yourself the space to like 
try other things or like, you know, create a lot of prototypes or things that are going to fail. Like, cause those are the things I look back on. I'm like, I look back at some of those really early projects that I showed and I'm like, I didn't know what I was doing. Like, I didn't really have a purpose at that point. And it was almost for the better. Like I, it was like, I was just discovering and I was learning and, and now I have a little bit more of an understanding of like my goals. And I could go back and take those like mindless projects or things that was like, I was so like naive, like when I was yeah. talking, yeah. doing stuff, now I know how to make, you know, do pattern making and like, sew things correctly and whatever. And it's like, I almost, you start to lose that like sense of like, I could do anything or like bound, but no boundaries at all. So I think, I don't know if that really answers the question, but I do feel like having yeah. a mix of both, never like just only going by the books, only trying to chase that North star, allow yourself to have those side quests, I think. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Um, I it, I asked you this before. It, you showed us this coat. It was like a jacket, and it had you know, it was just so artfully, beautifully done. But, um, and I asked you like, how did you know how to make a jacket? Even like, how did you know about the body and stuff like that? And I think this. I'm asked. I'm. I wanted to get at the question again because I think it does go into package design because clothes are sort of a packaging for a human right in so far as they protect us from you know the wet, the elements and but they do something more they do something artful which is to highlight the human form and and they move in certain ways because the human body moves so it, it you know like a package on a shelf doesn't necessarily move but just to give me an idea last week we were talking to the guest i was talking to was talking about apple packaging right that which is like the whole universe of package design in, in and of itself and he was making the point that apple boxes even open a certain way like they have a certain amount of suction Ooh, right yeah <laughs> yeah right and like we all feel that's a feeling that is not something that can be written down on paper um or or communicated even through sound it's a feeling it's a haptic thing right yeah um and i think that you know clothes have the same um there's the same requirement that they have to move a certain way um to highlight the shape of the body and the movement of the body which is a beautiful thing right so in terms of like package design how do students like how do people just learning how to enclose three-dimensional objects in you know given your experience how how would you recommend they do this you know, if they're given random 3D objects to enclose, like how yeah. do you make those decisions lack, you know, without technology or with low tech? Yeah. Which is how I think you seem to work, you know. That example is such a good example. And like I I know the genius of Apple, but I like literally haven't sat here and thought about what you just said. Like mm -hmm. about the pack. Like, and I know, like I know exactly the feeling that you're just feels describing. good. Like it's a good feeling. They, but Apple is so like, they're really genius in the way that they do things. They basically, they make all the decisions for you. So you don't have to. So when you open your phone, you have the ringtone, you have this, like it yeah. already, like, that's why people are so drawn to their product because it's like, yeah. I don't have to like, I get a clean like experience and I don't even have to really like, you know, do that much to have it, you know? Yeah. I think that I don't really know if this is going to like fully answer the question, but I, I think a really good example between connecting what you just said about the, that packaging and fashion is, and I don't know if you've seen them before and I don't know if the audience has, and if you haven't, I would just Google it, Arteryx jackets. And this is why I don't think I really realized why I was so drawn to them when I, before I started working with them, before I like even really got like into the fashion industry but most jackets when they're sitting on a hanger are like just it's just a jacket you know it's just hanging there whatever their jackets are have an articulated sleeve and so like they always look like they're in motion mm -hmm. and it's the same thing with logos too so if you think about all like the logos of running sneakers that are successful yep. like nike moving forward like yep. puma animal moving forward yeah. and then some brands that yeah. have been less successful doing that is like an Under Armour where it's like a very static logo placed on a shoe or even Reebok did a rebrand. I mean, some people might, depending on your age, you might not, you might, might think certain logos, but they had this, like, it was called a vector and it was kind of like, you know, cross it, 
crossing into itself and like moving and then they ch changed it to while i was working there they changed it to this um logo that was actually meant for crossfit uh it was a triangle and it's called the delta and it's like this little triangle thing and like placing that on shoes i just remember be it was it was so difficult as a graphic designer that was like specializing in putting logos on things i was like this logo isn't pushing you forward this is an it's static movie. like yeah so i don't know if that like this is something i think about like trying to create like an experience when you're like looking at something or like a package i mean i'm not a traditional package designer i guess in some other sense of the word i guess i am but like getting yeah. that feeling or having an emotion when you look at something okay interesting um and i think uh the last question i had for you um because unfortunately, I think we're just about out of time. You mentioned something else, which I hadn't thought about, which, um, well, there was two things. So first of all, you said that Apple thinks everything for you, mm -hmm. right? Which I totally agree. They, the experience is so thought out. There were basically passive observers uh, in some ways, right? We, yeah. I mean, you, you can create amazing things on Apple products, but with in particular the iPhones, iPads, and certainly the Vision Pro, it's a consumption device, a beautiful seamless mostly experience in consumption not producing you're doing the opposite like you you are taking things that have been made for us but you're recontextualizing them and therefore producing something out of it and i think that that's what's different there's like a tyranny in this passivity that apple and other similar nobody's as good at it as apple is but we become a little passive and I think there's a certain tyranny in that because we're not producing anything. So, and with Apple products also historically and also famously, they're extremely difficult to repair, right? Mm -hmm. They're tech, they're tech gadgets. I get it. They would be difficult anyway, but there's a right to repair movement, right? That's even suing Apple to ensure that we as consumers have a, a right to take right. them and be yeah. able to repair them ourselves. Right. Mm -hmm. it, we don't really have something similar with clothing but um, you you advocate as as I would that we could all kind of learn how to sew and become part of this. So uh, be part of like a right to repair our own clothing movement. Mm -hmm. I think something like that has existed. The right to make your own clothes. This is like a very yeah. 70s vibe. Are you in any way kind of drawing from that? Like the, like a 50s, 60s, 70s housewife making your own clothes sort of like world. That you, I, you, you know, yeah, how do you I, feel well, about that? I I definitely like I didn't have like home ec in in school right. or anything like that where like my mom definitely did and like I think you know for for good reasons we don't have these like gender roles assigned anymore but I do think anybody any gender should be or any yeah. person should be like interested in the idea of repair whether yeah. like again like you don't have to go like be making quilts like how they did back in the day a lot of things were done out of like necessity or like being poor and like I mean upcycling and reworking like this is not a new concept this has been around mm -hmm. like this is an indigenous practice like this has yep. been around for so long and it's just the idea of like people repaired things because they had to nowadays mm -hmm. I don't have to because I could just go buy something new but is that the right ethical solution no I, I don't think so yeah. I think it's important to do but I have to say like and this is what to end on what gives me hope here is the fact that like over the past couple of years is I've seen so many people like Instagram, TikTok, like young people picking up a sewing machine and learning how to do these things and turning to upcycling because it is the most cost effective thing versus going and buying new material rolls from a store or a fabric store, or whatever. Yeah. They can go to the thrift store and buy a fleece and turn it into a bag and like feel a little less guilty about like, you know, if there yeah. is scraps or waste, it's like it was already destined for the trash so why yep. not there so that's incredible i think we'll sh we should leave it there on that high note on that positive note <laughs> uh thank you so much nicole for for visiting with us um i would hopefully maybe someday if you're on the east coast again we could do something at lehman that would be very cool uh, yeah. like a workshop for example I uh, i would love that uh so thank you everybody for coming for uh sharing your information there's some uh, in the q a there's some book um okay. recommendations for y'all i'll also mirror those in the chat uh really quick before i let you all go and then um everybody please uh join us next week for the
Uh, have a good rest of your day and uh, we'll see everybody next week. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye.